Welcome to section 4.20 where we're going to discuss human characteristics, specifically Mendelian human characteristics, meaning that they are controlled by one gene that will completely choose what phenotype you have based upon whether you have the dominant allele or based upon whether you have both recessive alleles. So these are going to be a lot like what Mendel did. Now for our autosomal traits, so these are going to be on chromosomes that do not determine sex, so it won't matter if you're male or female, everybody has an equal chance at getting these. Uh, there's three traits that we'll discuss. Now the first of which is attached earlobes. Most people have the dominant trait which is free earlobes. So that's earlobes that kind of go down and then come back up. So you have like a flap here that you can kind of move. With attached earlobes, they come down and attach. So you can see right here, there's not like a dangly piece like over here. Uh, so this will be the recessive version, whereas this will be the dominant version that you'll have. Okay. The next thing we have is hitchhiker's thumb. So with hitchhiker's thumb, and I can only show you the recessive, uh, hitchhiker's thumb having it is dominant, and this will be where your thumb goes up but then curls back. Uh, you can see it in the picture right here. Uh, so it's almost like you're holding your hand like this where your thumb's straight up, but then it should be pointing backwards. Mine is a non-hitchhiker thumb, so this means that I have two recessive alleles and neither of them is the dominant for this. So I just point more or less straight up. The last one we have is widow's peak, which is dominant. Uh, and so widow's peak is where your hairline will go and it has this little part here where it comes forward a bit. So you don't have a straight hairline, it kind of goes and makes a little bit more of a triangle. Now, for some people this can be difficult because if you're like me, you don't know if this is just a really big widow's peak or if you have a receding hairline. Uh, but for most people, assuming they still have all of their hair, you can just try and look and see if there's a little bit that kind of sticks down towards the middle of their forehead. If they lack that and it goes straight across, that would be the recessive trait. So recessive dominant, dominant, recessive. So these are just three of the autosomal ones that we'll talk about. Now. For sex-linked traits, we have two of these we can discuss. Now there are more traits that we're going to pick up with genetic disorders, but right now I'm trying to pick ones uh, that are not necessarily earth-shattering, although one could argue hemophilia is kind of a disorder, but I'm going to sneak it in so we have two to discuss. So red-green colorblindness we mentioned briefly in the previous section about sex linkage. So in humans, this is where you have difficulty with these particular colors and this one is located on the X chromosome. It is a recessive condition, like we've discussed, both of these are. And so we said it affects mostly males because they only have one chance to get a good allele. And if mom gives them a bad allele, then they're just stuck with it. Now this is important because if you look over here at the diagram, you'll see males can be unaffected, so normal vision, or they can be affected, but they can't be a carrier. Females, however, can be a carrier, which just means a heterozygote, so they're not affected, they're not colorblind, but they do carry the allele for colorblindness which they can then pass on to their sons because the sons only get the gene for colorblindness from their mom. The dad gives them a Y chromosome, so ultimately that's his contribution. He gives them nothing for colorblindness. So if you remember with those Punnett squares when you're setting it up, uh, it's entirely the mom that's going to matter. So if we're saying healthy, you know, unhealthy, dad's healthy, we set this up before and said how the boys don't get anything coding for hemophilia, colorblindness, any of these excellent traits from dad. Now hemophilia is when you have issues clotting your blood. And so you have to really watch out because people, if they have bruising or cuts, uh, in some cases they can actually bleed to death because they won't clot properly. And so if it's a bad enough wound, they can bleed out in the process. Uh, this became a really big deal in the 80s as well because they often need blood transfusions. And so when the blood transfusions uh, back then were sometimes contaminated with HIV, you had where a fair amount of hemophiliacs ended up contracting HIV and then later AIDS as the HIV destroyed their immune system. So this one, if people were alive during the 80s and early 90s, there's quite a few people that know what hemophilia is just because of that. But this is also going to be a recessive condition that's on the X chromosome. So once again, this will more, more than likely affect males. Now, one way for us to track all these things is to make a pedigree. Now, a pedigree allows us to kind of look and try to figure out what's going on. Now, the first thing we can do with a pedigree is we can usually figure out if something is dominant or if something is recessive. So right now, we're going to have colored in the affected individuals. So in this case, we're saying that attached earlobes means you're affected. 
So the recessive trait means you have what we're looking for, so we color you in. So looking at this, you know the genotype of every affected individual. Every affected individual has to be little f, little f, because that's the only way to have attached earlobes, which in this case actually is this, sorry. Now if you have the dominant trait, if you have free earlobes, that could be big F, little f, or big F, big F. There's two possibilities. So we can't just look and say, oh look, your thing isn't colored in. You must be big F, big F. I don't know for sure by default. All I know is you have at least one dominant. So sometimes people write that like big F and then a line to show that something else is there, but we're not sure. The fun thing about a pedigree is once you've looked at it and you kind of figure out what's going on, you can oftentimes deduce or figure out the genotype from it. So let's start off. First things first, I can look through, and this one's kind of interesting where I wouldn't know for sure just looking at this, whether this trait is recessive or dominant. This one, quite frankly, if I looked at, there's a decent chance I would think it's dominant. And the reason for that is you can usually tell a recessive pedigree because it skips generations. So like over here on this pedigree, you'll notice neither parent has whatever this is. It doesn't really matter what it is for our purposes, but some of the children do. So right away I can tell that this must be something that's recessive because if it's dominant, one of the parents has to have it to be able to pass it on. So you can see up here, even though technically this is recessive, we don't have enough info, that it doesn't have enough generations for us to notice it skip a generation because it only has to skip a generation once to be recessive. So for this one, I would likely look at it and think it was dominant initially because dominance will follow a pattern like this usually where a parent has it, then the kid has it. You know, parent has it, kid can have it. So you might see where the parent has it and the kids don't, but you should not see where the parents don't have it and the kids do have it. So this one's a bit ambiguous. If I was looking at this one, I would quite frankly tell you it's more than likely going to be dominant. Uh, so if you see one like this, even though we know this one's an exception, uh, just keep in mind if you see it never skips a generation. If the parents always have it, at least one of them, if a child has it, that implies it's probably going to be dominant. The other idea we can do is we can look at this and see that there are plenty of girls affected, plenty of boys. So this one's probably autosomal. When you look over here, you'll see it's all boys affected. If you have all boys or nearly all boys that are affected, you would also throw the red flag that this is likely sex linked. Okay? So when we look at these pedigrees, I might ask you, you know, what is the inheritance pattern? And that usually is going to be autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, sex linked dominant, sex linked recessive. So if we kind of write our options down here, autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, sex linked dominant, or sex linked recessive. You're not going to see too many of the dominants as far as disorders go, uh, but for some of our traits like free earlobes, we could track that. It'd be dominant. Now over here, as we look at stuff, we can also figure out genotypes. If I know this parent has to be homozygous recessive, then I know the offspring, even if they're dominant, must be heterozygotes. So I can manage to figure this stuff out fairly easily. If I see that a homozygous recessive bred with someone who's dominant, I don't know exactly what their genotype is, and they had kids that were recessive. This is essentially a test cross. In order to have recessive children, both parents must have at least one recessive allele. So I know, because these kids are affected, that this parent here has to be a heterozygote. If they were big F, big F, there could be none of these children that have attached earlobes because they'd all get a dominant allele from the other parent, so they'd all have the dominant trait, which is free earlobes. So by looking at these pedigrees and looking at the offspring, we can oftentimes figure out the genotypes of the parents. And if we know the genotypes of the parents, we can oftentimes do the reverse and figure out the genotypes of the offspring. So going through here, you can see that we can kind of go in and fill in all of these just because we know what's going on. It's made easier because all these crosses involve a guy that's recessive. But this can get interesting where if this person here, for instance, was not a person that had attached earlobes. So let's assume that they're just like this person. You know, neither of them has them. If one of their kids had this, I'd know immediately they must both be heterozygotes because once again, to have an affected offspring, they both have to have the recessive allele. If none of their kids came out recessive, there'd be a decent chance at least one of them's homozygous dominant. I wouldn't know which. You know, on a pedigree, there will be some times when you'll look at somebody and say, this is all I can tell you. They have at least one dominant allele. I don't know what the other allele is. So in class, we're going to go through and practice with some of these to make sure you're comfortable, but you should feel comfortable drawing these out where you just start off where each kind of row of these 
shapes will be a generation. Start at the top with the first generation, work your way down. These can go on and on and on, although in class I doubt it ever go beyond three generations. Squares will always be males, circles will be females, and once again, whatever trait you're tracking will always be colored in. That's how you signify they had the trait. Now, what you're tracking is up to you. You could be tracking free earlobes, you could be tracking attached earlobes, you can be tracking color blindness or normal vision. That's up to you what you're doing. But when one's colored in, that's what lets you know this. Occasionally, to let people know that they've discovered more info, sometimes they'll go through as well and they'll half shade in some of these to show that they're heterozygous. So because we know for sure that some of these guys are heterozygous, because we were able to figure out some of the genotypes of the parents as well as the kids, uh, sometimes you will see it drawn like this, so don't freak out if you see some that are half full. It's just another way of saying they're heterozygotes. You can also literally just write the alleles, big F, little f, that's okay too. Uh, but on pedigrees like this, you should expect that I might make you identify the inheritance pattern, which we talked about down here, and I also might you, make you identify uh, things like what are the genotypes of this particular person, and sometimes I'll describe it because I'll use Roman numerals oftentimes to describe the generations, and then I can label these things like A, B, C, and D, so I can tell you 1A, you know, what's that person's genotype. 1B, what's that person's genotype? So don't freak out if you see me asking stuff like that. Uh, you'll see this on the worksheet we do in class, but I just want to make sure you're comfortable with the numerical systems that we use to try and describe people within a pedigree.